Hi, everybody, um, and welcome to our 38th seminar of the Centre of Research Excellence in Aphasia Recovery and Rehabilitation. I'm Dr. Sonia Brownset, a research fellow here at the Aphasia CRE and co-facilitator of the seminar series, along with Dr. John Pierce. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge that this event and many of our participants joining us today are located on the lands of the traditional custodians in Australia. Today, I'm speaking to you from the land of the Turrbal people. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend this respect to any First Nations people joining us here online today. Today, I'm absolutely delighted to have Associate Professor Stephen Wilson joining us from the University of Queensland. Stephen will be presenting on the recovery from aphasia in the first year after stroke. Before I formally introduce Stephen, I'd like to just briefly go over some housekeeping. If you haven't already done so, please do join us as a member of the Aphasia CRE community of practice. We welcome people with aphasia, their family, friends, health professionals, researchers, and organizations to our Aphasia CRE community of practice. The CRE is always looking for financial support. So if you do wish to donate, please do see our website for details. And you can connect with us on social media via Twitter and Facebook. And as always, please feel free to tweet along with today's seminar using the hashtag AphasiaCRE. Please do know that this seminar is being recorded for future viewing. You can find past seminar webinar videos on the Aphasia CRE website. Just click on the resources tab. The Aphasia CRE also now has a YouTube channel where you can access past seminar recordings. So you can subscribe to that to receive notifications about new videos if you prefer. Hopefully this seminar is going to spark lots of questions. I'm sure it will. You can write your questions in the question and answer function on the Zoom toolbar at the bottom of your screen. If you could do that rather than the chat box, that would be helpful. Enter your question to Stephen at any time throughout the presentation. You'll also be able to see the other questions asked by other audience members. You can then like or upvote a question to show those of most interest to the group. Stephen will answer as many questions as time will allow but please reserve this Q&A space for questions only and keep your questions brief and no comments please. So now it is my privilege to introduce our speaker today, Associate Professor Stephen Wilson, who as you can imagine I'm delighted has recently joined us here at the School of Health and Rehabilitation Sciences at the University of Queensland. Stephen's a cognitive neuroscientist with a research focus on the understanding of the neural basis of language. Until recently, Stephen was associate professor at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, where the work he's presented today was carried out. Stephen has co-authored over 80 papers on aphasia and the neuroscience of language. His research has been continuously funded by the National Institute of Health since 2010. He also serves on the Board of Directors for the Society of the Neurobiology of Language as an inaugural senior editor of Neurobiology of Language and as an editor of the Journal of Speech, Language and Hearing Research. He's interested in recruiting new PhD students here in Queensland. Um, for, and so anyone interested in language in the brain wanted to join him, please do reach out. Now I'd like to hand over to Stephen. Thank you for joining us today, Stephen, and welcome to the CRE. Thank you very much, Sonia, for that lovely introduction. And it's very nice to join you here, um, as well as at UQ. Um, so let me just see if I can get my uh, sharing working. OK. And then I need to press another button somewhere. There we go. Thank you all for tuning in today. Um, my talk is called The Neural Basis of Recovery from Aphasia After Stroke. And I'd like to also start by acknowledging the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet, pay my respect to their ancestors and their descendants. I would, I, I also like to kick off by uh, talking about my co-authors and collaborators um, who have put so much work into this project, especially um, 
these four individuals who I'm showing you pictures of here, Sarah Schneck, Gillian Entrep, Caitlin Onischek, and Deb Levy, um, as well as all, and I'm, I'm gonna kind of mention throughout the presentation some of the contributions they made to this work. I'd also like to thank all of the other co-authors on this particular paper, as well as some of the other key players that have, um, to the work which uh, underlies this paper. Um, the many stroke survivors we worked with who gave so much of their time and energy to participate in our research, their caregivers, loved ones, um, clinical uh, staff that we worked with and uh, NIH for supporting our work. Um, so yeah, the, the, the study I'm talking about today is uh, recently published. Um, it, uh, and I've given the reference. So um, I think I've, I should have provided the link if I haven't already, but anyway, um, it comes from, uh, we start with the observation that we know that language regions are localized to the left hemisphere of the brain in most people. Um, and that we know this since Broca and then before him, the Dax, the Dax's father and son, but we can talk about the history of that um, discovery another time. We also, um, you know, this is a very salient and obvious fact that can be demonstrated easily these days with functional neuroimaging in individual participants. And here's a picture from, from my lab of language areas localized to the left hemisphere of the brain. We also know um, that different regions have distinct functions. So it's not just that there's like a single language area that does certain things. There's some kind of mosaic of cortical regions that have, uh, there's a structure to it. Uh, and there's various different models of that out there. The most complicated of which is definitely Kathy Price's um, uh, model, which I've got there. Um, but it doesn't really matter the particular model. Um, the interesting thing is um, that there is a, you know, a set of regions that have distinct functions. So then we, you know, the question arises like what happens when they get damaged? And it's interestingly, we know that in principle, like quite dramatic plasticity is possible. And we know that from um, studies of kids with perinatal stroke. So this is a study from Alyssa Newport and colleagues. Um, and you can see that um, it's a language localizer fMRI um, contrast. And you can see on the left here, control participants have their language areas in the left hemisphere. And in the, on the right, we see perinatal stroke, two perinatal people, who, individuals who suffered strokes at birth. You can see they have large left hemisphere strokes and their language areas are beautifully localized to the right hemisphere. So we know in principle um, that language can reorganize. We just don't know um, under exactly what conditions. So when language regions are damaged, as you all know, I'm sure aphasia typically results, um, but most patients do recover to some extent. And as an example, and this is from um, Cortez and McCabe's classic study uh, on recovery from 1977. And here's one of our patients who always just kind of keeps me awake at night thinking about what's going on with his brain. As you can see, he's got like a really large uh, left frontal stroke, but at this point, nine years post-stroke, he can speak quite well. And an example of his language is, I'm the very enthusiastically working on a novel. Um, that's the second novel. I am um, really want to have it done this year. So in the, in the mid, late fall, et cetera. Um, so you can see it's not perfect. He certainly has aphasia, um, but by no means does he have um, a classic broker's aphasia. So um, in my lab, we are really interested in understanding the neural basis that allows this extent of recovery because clearly he's, um, you know, he's able to, he's got a, a largely functional language system despite missing many of those components which are mapped out by the different models of language in the left hemisphere. And so we're really interested in understanding what that process looks like of recovery and ultimately understanding what's changing in the brain to make it possible. But the work that I'm talking to you all about today um, is mostly a behavioral study of just trying to look descriptively at the first year after stroke and um, see what takes place during that time. First year, as you all know, is very important because that is when the majority of recovery takes place. There is a decelerating curve of recovery that's been documented many times over. Um, and a lot of people will even say that, you know, patients become chronic at six months or one year or um, that, you know, kind of almost implying that there's no further recovery. Well, we know that's not true, um, but at the same time, we, we do know that the majority of recovery does take place early. So this is in a way um, a, the most critical time period, I think, to if we want to study 
the trajectories of recovery. So here's our study. Um, uh, we started this um, when I moved to Vanderbilt in 2016 in, in late 2016. And we collected data up until some event in early 2020, which I don't even want to talk about because it's still traumatic. Um, but as you can imagine, we had to um, kind of put a hold on our research activities. Um, that ended up being, um, so then, we, then during the pandemic, we um, spent that time working on the data that we had acquired and, and carrying out the analyses that um, I'm presenting to you today. So this is basically about a little over three years of data. Um, and then as we come out of the pandemic, um, we are collecting data again and expanding the study in the future. So hopefully at some time in the future, I'll be able to share even more. But this is our first 354 patients. So we recruit people at the bedside at Vanderbilt uh, University Medical Center. Um, it's a very large stroke center. It sees well over a thousand patients a year from, from much of Middle Tennessee as well as adjacent states. Um, and our criteria for inclusion, essentially we try to study any left hemisphere stroke patient. So when we went into this, we really didn't have strong preconceptions about what we were going to find. Um, we also, we, we, it has to be a first stroke though, because, and there has to be no prior neuro history. So that those are definitely like um, notable exclusionary factors um, that's going to kind of narrow the, uh, what we can, what we can conclude. Um, we also include um, people who have right hemisphere stroke and clearly have aphasia. So if they have, um, where the evidence um, indicates that they have right hemisphere language dominance. Um, that isn't very common, but we do have a few people like that in our sample. So ultimately we evaluate every person who comes, um, who is seen by the stroke service and we evaluate them against our inclusion criteria. And over this time, we found 493 eligible patients. We missed about, we missed 92 of them because of weekends and other um, miscellaneous reasons and um, some small proportion of people declined consent, um, but we did ultimately consent the majority of the uh, eligible people. We consented 354. And we then we try to test them uh, acutely, um, to test their speech and language acutely, and then follow up at one month, three months, and 12 months. Um, we also do imaging at those later time points of one month, three months, and 12 points. 12 months, and I'm not gonna talk about that too much today, or maybe not at all, depending on how much time I take. Um, so I'm really mostly just focusing today on the behavioral observations. So of those, of the people that we, sometimes people are untestable acutely, then we consent them uh, through surrogate consent um, and try to follow up at um, subsequent time points. Um, and so, yeah, we ultimately obtained follow-up data for 121. So we only follow people up if they have aphasia acutely. There's really not much to, to see if they don't have aphasia acutely, but we basically, we had 200 people with acute aphasia plus another 18 who are untestable. Um, and then we follow up ultimately with 121 of them. So we don't have, we, we follow up a little bit more than half of the people that we recruit. Um, and the people who we follow up are fairly representative of the whole sample. There's no difference in their initial um, aphasia severity of who we do and don't follow up with. Um, we evaluate people's speech and language function using the quick aphasia battery, which we developed um, specifically for this study. Um, it's about a 15 minute eval. It's impairment based. Um, it we carefully chose the items. The items are rather few in number. A lot of the subtests have six items, um, but we chose the items carefully to span a, a difficulty range so that we can um, hit um, mild, moderate, and severe impairments and, and measure them all uh, relatively accurately. Um, the quick aphasia battery, or QAB, as I will maybe refer to it, um, has good concurrent validity with respect to the Western aphasia battery, which everybody's surely familiar with. This is just, this uh, figure here is showing concurrent validity. Um, so it's quite, a, it gives us a pretty good handle on people's speech and language um, while being practical to administer at the bedside. Um, in total, we, this, the data I'm presenting today based on 589 speech language evaluations. And 
Um, a lot of them were so that, you know, we have about, you know, half of them are done acutely. And then we have a lot of people come back to Vanderbilt and we do, um, we uh, evaluate them again at the same time as we do uh, functional and structural MRI. But also a lot of people who were unable or unwilling to come back to Vanderbilt, we would basically go to their homes and or uh, wherever they were and test them there. Um, so here's a beautiful rural road in Tennessee, and most, most of our participants were um, living in rural areas. Um, this is Sarah Schneck and Gillian Entrip. Um, Gillian, I'd say, did the most of these follow-ups. She did really drove all over the state for years. Here's Caitlin Onuscheck. She also drove all over the state a whole bunch. Um, so those, the three of these three SLPs uh, acquired all the data that I'm talking about today. So it's really like you know. This is like six years of work for a whole team of people, especially these people. So I always want to like just kind of call out like how much uh, they did for this study. Um, we um, are going to look at recovery with respect to um, clinical imaging. So the sort of standard clinical imaging that's acquired um, uh, that would be similar to it would be, would be acquired at any stroke center. Um, so basically that consists of um, diffusion weighted MRI, which allows you to see strokes uh, at a very early, like within half an hour of the insult um, flare, or in the case of people who are not MRI compatible, we have CT. Um, so you can see here an example of uh, a stroke on DWI. And what we do is we draw them manually. Um, we tried a lot of ways to, to automate that process and nothing was really satisfactory ultimately. So um, we drew them manually um, and that's what Deb Levy took leadership of. And she was um, along with an undergrad named Misa Rahman. They, they drew all of the 354 lesions. So you can see some examples there. This is a, um, a hemorrhage that's been drawn. We're excluding the edema. Here's a CT where it's kind of hard to see the lesion, but that we've still drawn it. And then after we'd drawn everybody's lesion, we went back and forward with a lot of different ways of analyzing this data, um, but kind of came to this approach, which, I'm, which I hope you'll think is effective, um, where we divided people into groups based on their lesion location. And then we can talk about the trajectories of recovery in each group. And we also tried to do, we tried to, do the group categorization with um, unsupervised um, clustering algorithms, um, but could never really get great results from that. Um, so in the end, we went with more domain knowledge and kind of based, took into account the dorsal ventral model of language, which is so prominent in our field, um, and which I think is definitely true um, in its broad outline. Um, so we kind of did take, a t you know, we did attend to those Sort of functional anatomical divisions that we know about as we do as we define our groups and you'll see what i mean by this as i go on a bit so we found we basically divide the patients into 13 groups who have similar patterns of damage and then there's a 14th group of other so we can't say too much about the other people because they you know are a very you know they kind of have a mixed bag of lesions um, but in all of the other groups, we have pretty coherent sets of patients that have similar patterns of brain damage. And what this um, image is showing here is um, the 354 patients on each axis, um, and then the similarity between their lesions where bright colors mean similar, and we've put them into these groups. So F minus, for instance, means small frontal lesions, and you'll see that all the patients in this box um, they, they're going to tend to have bright colors because they resemble one another in terms of their lesions. Down here is like, you know, to give another example, basal ganglia lesions, they all quite well resemble one another. So that's just kind of quantifying that the people that we've grouped um, into these lesion defined groups actually have rather similar looking um, patterns of brain damage. And I'll show you some examples of that as we go forward. Okay, so um, now, getting into the results of the study, um, in a moment, I'm going to show you uh, trajectories of recovery for the 13 different groups. Um, but before that, I'll just mention the linear models that we fit to the data. Um, so what we so we modeled initial severity and then we modeled modeled recovery. So in, when we modeled initial severity, we could explain about 60% of the variance. And it was almost all being explained by lesion location and extent. 
So that, in other words, a model that included those factors explained 58% more variance relative to a model that it did not. Uh, the other factors we had in our model were the kind of things that you would see in every study, age, sex, education, handedness, uh, and stroke type. We had a very small effect of age. Um, people that were older did uh, had more severe aphasia initially. We did not have any effects of sex, education, or handedness, um, but those two were kind of a surprise to me, but that's what we found. Uh, we also, I think we had a small effect of stroke type uh, hemorrhages and it worse initially. Um, but you know, I think the big picture here is like it's we don't want to be distracted by the fact that age is statistically significant. Um, when you look at the amount of variance explained, it's very tiny. Really, you know, almost everything that we can like we can predict very well who's how severe people's aphasia is going to be, um, and we can do it almost entirely based on lesion location and extent. So you know, the explanatory factors here are neuroanatomical, not anything else. Um, Similarly, when we model recovery, which is in other words, modeling the change between subsequent time points, like from the acute time point to one month, from one to three, and from three to 12, um, we can explain about 60% of that variance as well. In this case, the biggest explanatory factors are the previous score, which kind of predicts how much recovery is possible, right? So people that are um, starting off, uh, you know, if you have more severe aphasia, then you have more potential for improvement. Uh, and time point is another huge factor. That's the, there's that decelerating curve that I mentioned before, where we're seeing more recovery at earlier time points. We also find that lesion location and extent do predict the amount of subsequent recovery, not, not as much as the sort of more fundamental things, but very significantly and meaningfully. Um, in terms of predicting recovery, we didn't find effects of any other variable. So not no age, sex, education, handedness, stroke type, and not even the number of hours of speech language treatment that people had received. Although this is not a study about treatment and we um, really could only measure the amount, not the nature of it. And we know that the treatment varied in quality. So I don't want to make too much of that, but we did not find an effective treatment. Okay, so now I'm getting to the heart of the talk, um, which is the trajectories of recovery that we observe in the different lesion defined groups. So I'm going to show you a bunch of figures that all look like this. I'm going to kind of spend some time orienting you all to this figure. So in this corner up here, we have um, the lesion overlay for this group. So this is the group of patients with frontal lesions that are not too extensive. I call it F minus. So we have like a, an abbreviation for each group. Um, so you can see these people um, have rather similar lesions. Um, down below that, we have four um, individual patients where you can see their lesion in three dimensions. And these are the objectively four most representative patients. In other words, they're the four people whose lesions minimize the distance between themselves and the whole group of patients in terms of their lesion similarity. So you can see here that even though I'm calling these people, you know, small frontal lesions, they're actually not that small. Like, I mean, these are the kind of lesions that any neurologist would look at and say, that person's gonna have a Broca's aphasia. Um, but you can see the, you know, you can see those four and they're pretty representative of the group. Uh, that number there is the number of patients in the group. So that's 29 patients in this group. Um, that's the maximum uh, overla uh, overlap. And then over here, we have their recovery um, of speech and language function in terms of the QAB overall score with time on the X axis and severity on the Y axis where zero is most impaired and 10 is normal. Um, and then we have our subdomains of the quick aphasia battery, um, word comprehension, sentence comprehension, word finding, grammatical construction, phonological encoding, speech motor programming, which means um, the absence of apraxia of speech, uh, speech motor execution, which means the absence of dysarthria, and reading. Um, so what you can see here for these uh, small frontal lesion patients is that we have really diverse presentations acutely, ranging from negligible to severe. Um, but we have a really uh, impressive recovery. So people are, most patients are recovering really well, such that by a year, um, everybody is either kind of in the uh, mild to no aphasia, although let's be real here, everybody that, you know, you don't really ever have no aphasia after you've had aphasia. Um, but they're, testing above the QAB aphasia cutoff in many cases. So you can see um, that these patients with the relatively circumscribed frontal lesions have really good recoveries. 
Um, and you can see that's kind of across um, most aspects of language function. So word comprehension gets, you know, gets better, is never impaired in most people, but in the people that it is impaired in, it gets better real, uh, very quickly. Um, you know, we have more lingering deficits in things like sentence comprehension, and some people have lingering apraxia, you know, um, but you can see mostly that they have pretty good recovery across the board. So um, anybody that's, you know, likes their his, uh, history of aphasia will recognize that this is a replication of J.P. Moore's seminal works from the 70s. Um, although I will say, I think we have a lot more detail than he did. I mean, he's a neurologist and he's basically making these same claims um, that people with um, sort of lesions that are restricted to Broca's area actually recover really well. Um, but he's mostly doing it on the basis of chart review and, and um, you know, just basically descriptive assessments from a neurologist saying, oh yeah, they came in and they were speaking fine. Um, whereas now we have quantitative data to back up what Moore had concluded back in the 70s. And I think it's been replicated um, in several other contexts too. The, con the conclusion that uh, a relatively small um, frontal lesion um, has a really good outcome. What was more surprising was what we saw with patients who had much larger frontal lesions um, extending into the parietal lobe or into the temporal lobe and essentially into the ventral language stream. So you can see two groups here. Um, the top panel shows patients that had what we call F plus D lesions or frontal lesions that extend into the dorsal stream only, so mostly into the parietal lobe. And then down the bottom is F plus V, which means frontal lesions that extend into the ventral language stream, so into the usually into the superior parts of the temporal lobe. And if you look at the examples of the lesions in these groups, you can see these patients have really significant large lesions. These are the kind of um, you know, strokes that you would expect to be quite devastating. What we found was that acutely, um, everybody had severe to moderate aphasia at best. Um, almost everybody has severe aphasia acutely. Um, but in term, when, as we study the trajectory of recovery, you can see that it, there's a surprisingly good recovery, I would say, given the severity of, these, of the brain damage. It's kind of slow and steady um, so that by a year, most people are moderate, mild to moderate. And this person would still be severe, um, but the rest mild to moderate. And in the case of these, they're all in the mild to moderate range. So you can see that literally consistent, like just getting better and better over time. Um, again, there's interesting things to be and so this is very surprising to me. I really wouldn't have thought these people would recover so well. Um, and interestingly, it kind of uh, contradicts um, the other major claim that JP Moore made, which is that to get a persistent Broca's aphasia, you basically need a lesion like this, like our um, panel B here. So patients with damage to the upper division of the MCA territory, he said, would lead to a persistent Broca's aphasia. We don't find that. Um, I think it's true that like it's that's like a necessary condition to get a to get a persistent Broca's aphasia, but it's not a sufficient condition because if you look at an unselected group of patients with that lesion, as we did, then you'll find that most of them actually recover to be much better than Broca's aphasia. There's lots of really interesting details that you can delve into um, about like the particular domains. So, for instance, I mean, I'll just you know again word comprehension recovers really well and quickly in most people. Um, here's some interesting things like phonological encoding, i.e. like, you know, the opposite of that would be making phonemic paraphasias, recovers rather poorly, you know, there's a lot of variability. Um, like many people just don't have that symptom at all. Others have it quite markedly, um, but there's rather little recovery of people's um, phonological abilities in comparison to some other um, areas, like for instance, word finding, which kind of shows that um, more consistent recovery over time. Um, you know, apraxia is another one um, that you might wonder about. So we see, you know, rather modest recovery of apraxia, like it definitely recovers in some people, but um, it's usually at a less 
uh, impressive rate than their, some of their other language functions. Um, yeah, so that's the, the people who have large frontal lesions. When we move further back in the brain, um, we have a couple of groups here. This is people with temporal or temporoparietal lesions that are not too extensive. So these will be kind of centered on traditional Wernicke's area, but we're in, we've got a fair range here. Like, you know, even an anterior temporal lesion could be included in this group. Um, we've got people with parietal only lesions and people with ventral temporal lesions that are kind of um, inferior to Wernicke's area. The parietal would be superior to Wernicke's area. Um, so what all three of these groups have in common is that diverse initial presentation and, and really good overall recovery. So especially, you know, the parietal group recovering really well, ventral temporal group recovering really well, although as you might expect, reading can remain impaired in some of these patients, like reading can be a persistent deficit. Um, you know, there was just shockingly almost, I was shocked with how it came out, but I shouldn't have been. There was no apraxia at all in any of these patients. So if you look at the apraxia, the speech motor programming measures, we just never saw apraxia in these patients that had temporal or parietal lesions. So there's a lot of specificity. Um, and yeah, I was kind of like a little bit thrilled when we, when we saw the figures for the first time and saw how clean it was. Um, but again, there's this story of like pretty good um, recovery um, with all these posterior lesions, even though they're causing initial aphasias in many cases. So who doesn't recover well? Well, there's really only two groups it, um, who have persistent severe aphasia. Um, and they're perhaps not surprising, um, although I think it's surprising that there's only two. Um, one group that has poor outcomes are people with extensive perisylvian damage um, that impacts the frontal, temporal, and parietal lobes. You can see here four patients, you know, really all with huge lesions of MCA territory. Um, most of these people have severe aphasia acutely. In fact, they all do. This one person here shown in gray is an exception. Um, this is a person that definitely had right hemisphere language. And um, so when she had a massive left hemisphere stroke, she had only a mild aphasia. So we don't include her in the model, um, but I'm just kind of putting that data point there just so you can see it. Um, as you can see, these people have some recovery over the course of the year, but it's quite modest. And the majority of them are still um, severely aphasic at one year. Um, in this group, we never saw any recovery of apraxia of speech. Um, we saw slight recovery that was like kind of less than our um, measurement, which is the audio perceptual. Um, so we did think, yeah, like maybe if someone was a two on a scale of zero to four, they might be like going from like a low two to a high two, but we never saw one of these patients cross a category boundary. Um, we, we really in this, in this group, we saw rather inc very incremental um, improvement over the course of the year. And some things just remained almost at baseline. So sentence comprehension was very poor in almost every patient and really didn't get better. Um, the other group that where we saw poor long-term outcomes were people with extensive temporoparietal lesions. So you can see them here. These are people who have damage to Wernicke's area and it surrounds. And they recover a little bit, but you know they remain mostly severe, maybe moderate at best uh, in a year. Um, and again, there's that real striking selectivity um, by domain. So you know, absolutely no apraxia in this group, um, but their sentence comprehension is basically at flaw. So you know, if, they're, if they have to rely on syntax to comprehend a sentence, um, they can't. And even after a year, there's really negligible improvement in that. Whereas some other things did recover more. So you know, their word finding improves, their, their single word comprehension improves, although notably it's not like, you know, it can be still impaired at, you know, three months even or a year. Um, so th these, are the, these are the people who are probably winding up in a lot of the chronic aphasia treatment studies and, uh, you know, that people are doing around the world. Um, the, the, these are the people with, who are gonna have severe chronic aphasia. Um, I won't say too much about um, the other five groups um, because they all get better 
um, or don't have aphasia at all. So, you know, people with basal ganglia and thalamic strokes, very diverse initial presentation, um, good recovery. Most people are recovering to mild or no aphasia within a year with those subcortical strokes. Um, midline aphasias, absolutely fascinating. Um, they don't resemble any textbook aphasia at all. Um, they definitely have acute aphasia and they always recover really well. So this is, you know, like precuneous um, supplementary motor area, like midline prefrontal cortex. That's a fascinating group of people. They're not super common, of course, just because of the, um, you know, arterial anatomy. Um, and then we do not see aphasia in people with occipital strokes or Rolandic strokes. So like in the sensory motor cortex, we don't ever see aphasia in those people. So it's kind of nice to be able to, you know, rule out some brain areas and just say, you know, you're not gonna have aphasia if you have damage there. Um, I've mentioned along the way, a couple of, you know, inter like interesting features of particular language domains. Um, in this rather complicated figure, that I'll just take a moment to explain. Um, we start to, I try to, give you an impression of the way the domains can dissociate in interesting ways. So in all eight of these graphs, I've got the QAB overall score on the x-axis, and then I've got the different subdomains on the y-axis. So, so here up in the top left, we've got word comprehension, then we have sentence comprehension, then we have word finding, and so on. Um, and then we, what we're showing here is how patients proceed through space, like how they make trajectories through space. Um, so each patient is shown by a, a line connecting dots for their different time points. And so what you see here is that some domains really tend to recover very much in line. There's a, there's a couple of different patterns that you see across domains, right? So one pattern you see with word finding and also with grammatical construction, which is the ability to form sentences, um, by and large, people are kind of performing in line with their overall severity. So, I mean, we all know that AQ correlates really highly with naming performance. So it's probably not much surprise um, that people's word finding very, you know, basically almost always is in line with their overall aphasia severity. You, it's very rare to see a striking dissociation. Um, but that pattern is not like that across the board. So in for word comprehension, for instance, um, it has a different pattern in that it can often be selectively spared. And so there can be people who are quite aphasic, but are spared in word comprehension. That would mean they're going to fall into this top left quadrant. Then a third pattern that we can see is where a lot of people fall into the bottom right quadrant, which means they can be selectively impaired in something. So sentence comprehension is a good example of that. There are many people who are selectively impaired in sentence comprehension, despite being um, not that aphasic overall. Um, we see that with reading as well. Like reading is a domain that's su subject to selective impairment. And then you've got other domains where it can really go in both directions. You can have selective impairment or selective sparing. So motor speech, um, uh, like, you know, the absence of dysarthria would be one, apraxia would be another, and also phonological encoding. So um, that kind of leads to some interesting conclusions, which I'll get to in a moment about um, organizing like specificity of different um, brain language brain regions. Okay, so the, the implications, I think, um, of the big picture findings. Um, firstly, aphasia is dynamic, multidimensional, and gradated, um, by which I mean, they're really, I think that, some, I mean, I, I am a big fan of the history of our field and, um, you know, Broker, Wernicke, Lichtheim, and, and everything that followed. Um, and so I think that subtypes have a lot of theoretical and historical value, but I also think that they don't have any basis in reality at all. Um, and so I think that the, the right way to think about patients is um, that they have strengths and weaknesses across multiple language domains and that there are no subtypes, there are no meaningful clusters. Um, and, th and concepts like fluency are also, in my mind, meaningless because they, they're not dichotomies in our data and like people don't suddenly go from being non-fluent to being fluent they they kind of go through everybody goes through a gradual process over time um second conclusion i think we can draw draw is that left posterior temporal cortex is the most important language region you know even these very large frontal strokes people are having excellent recoveries it's not true of the very large temporal strokes so we really see the primacy of that language region which um was so that was definitely what um people thought um, even, you know, a hundred years ago, like uh, I'd say Pierre Marie. I mean, I don't want to give too much 
credence to, to him because some of his other ideas are a bit far-fetched um but this idea that you know the true aphasia is the posterior aphasia and um i think is really borne out in our data um i think our data suggests that the language network is i think we need to move away from extremes that there are debates like some people kind of think that the whole language network is pretty functionally homogenous um that air, you know one area can the the areas are quite similar in terms of their functional properties. There's a lot of functional imaging work that suggests that. On the other hand, you have these very detailed models, like I showed you in the first few slides, that kind of imply that different regions have very specific functions. I think that our data put um, really rule out both of those extremes and suggest that we need a middle ground, because if it was really functionally homogenous, we wouldn't see the striking dissociations that we do see. And if it was really as segregated as the models make out we wouldn't see the recovery that we see because you would because these strokes would take out comp certain functions completely but we never see really people with like a persistent deficit in a single domain that just can't recover um we always see um you know recovery to various extents um and then the fourth conclusion um is that the domains do differ a lot in the extent to which they are distributed um, versus relying on specific substrates. So just to give two examples, um, you know, word comprehension, I think is very clearly the most distributed domain um, because it is possible for almost everybody to recover um, their word comprehension abilities. And that distributed representation of word comprehension might even include to some extent the right hemisphere. Um, which obviously is spared in all of our patients. Um, in contrast, sentence comprehension um, is extremely dependent on posterior temporal cortex. Um, people that have damage there really do not recover in sentence comprehension. So it appears to be impossible for any other brain region to substitute that function. Um, another interesting one is apraxia of speech. You know, it has definitely relies on left frontal cortex um although in an interestingly different way because not everybody with left frontal damage is apraxic but everybody with apraxia has left frontal damage so um there's kind of a different uh, relationship between that function and its neural substrates that i could get into more if anyone's interested okay so um we can project as you can imagine from our from the data that I've shown you, um, the, the linear models as well as the the graphs, we can predict predict trajectories of recovery quite accurately based on people's acute imaging. And Deb Levy, um, who worked in my lab and is um, now a postdoc in Eddie Chang's lab, has just submitted a paper where she quantifies our ability to predict people's outcomes acutely and at one month, three months, and 12 months. Um, and as you might expect, we can do a really good job of predicting people's outcomes, um, not only in overall language function as measured by the QAB overall score, but we can predict most of the domains pretty well um, using uh, machine learning. Um, basically, she uses support vector regression. She divides the brain up into um, about a, a hundred plus parcels, quantifies how much damage there is to each parcel, and then um, builds models to predict outcomes. So um, that paper has just been submitted. I should mention that Deb is not only a brilliant scientist, but also amazingly artistic. And when she was in my lab, she was always making these incredibly creative um, contributions to lab culture that just made things so much more fun so for instance she once made a cake that was you know in the form of a, a participant going into an mri she made um chocolates that were um shaped based on like individual brains actually reconstructed from real individual mri um with like a 3d printer um you know she made ipa gummy candies it just never i you know you just can't replace that kind of person in your lab um so yeah, so this, you know, being able to predict recovery is uh, very important. It makes it like the, and the imaging makes a huge difference. So, um, you know, based on the models in this paper that I'm talking about, um, if, if we have a hypothetical patient who comes in acutely and they score two out of 10 on the QAB, if we build a model that doesn't have any lesion information in it, we predict them at one year to have a, they're gonna have a QAB score of 6.5, uh, which would be a moderate aphasia. But we wouldn't build a model 
like that, because as I've shown you, um, lesion location and extent are by far the most predictive factors. So we build our models. And what we find is it, our prediction of how that person's going to be doing it one year is strongly determined by what lesion category they fall into. So if they're in the F minus group, which is the small frontal lesions, we would predict them to have a mild aphasia at one year. If they're in the TP plus, which is the large temporary parietal lesions, we would predict 5.8 or a moderate aphasia at a year. And if they have um, complete perisylvian damage, we predict a 3.6 or severe aphasia at one year. So it's not, uh, you know, what I, my point is that it's not just a, it's a very large effect size of, of how much um, predictive power comes from knowing the lesion. And I think build, building this into clinical practice is going to be the, ne the next big challenge because there's so much information here that I do not think is being used uh, and taken advantage of right now in routine clinical practice. So um, I don't think I'm going to talk about the neural mechanisms for re recovery because I think I spent plenty of time talking about the descriptive study. I'm going to skip through this stuff and go to um, our last slide. Um, so if you would like to know more about um, our lab's work, um, we have a website, langneurosci.org. You can read the paper that I've been talking about today, as well as all our other papers. And I also have a podcast called the Language Neuroscience Podcast, where I mostly don't talk about my own work, but talk with other people. Um, so I, if you like to listen to podcasts and you, and you like learning about language in the brain, um, then I hope you'll give it a listen. You can find it on any place where you get your podcasts. So um, thank you all, and I'll be happy to answer anyone's questions. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Stephen. That was an incredible talk. Um, every time I hear some, some talks about that paper, I always learn something new. So it's really great to hear it again. Um, and I'm always so impressed with the sample size. It's got to be one of the biggest in the field. So well done for that. Um, and, and, and it's really nice how some of the work really beautifully overlaps with some of the work that's taking place in the CRE as well. So I think there'll be a lot of interest in, in what you just um, spoke about. So thank you very much. Um, I'm just going to read some of the questions now to you. Um, we've got a few coming up, but please feel free to add your questions into the Q&A box. Um, the most popular one at the moment is from Katerina Breitenstein, who's asking, how did you assess treatment dosage across the first year post-stroke, self-reported by patients? Did you look at the subgroups who had bouts of high intensive treatment during the first year post-stroke? That's a great question. I really appreciate it. And um, uh, Dr. Breitenstein, I, I do love your paper on aphasia treatment, um, your ICAP paper. Um, it's the, the most compelling one that I think that I've ever read. Um, but to answer your question, um, we quantified it by interview with the patients and their caregivers. Um, we basically asked them, you know, we just, you know, all of these, all of this took place in, you know, the context of conversations um, around, you know, around around, we don't just like, you know, meet them, do the language evaluation and then move on, right? So um, we had pretty extensive conversations with everybody, just kind of ask them like, you know, okay, so what kind of therapy did you have after you were discharged? Where did you go? How many hours was it? What, you know, uh, how long did you do that for? And so I think we got pretty accurate estimates of the amount of therapy from the patients and their loved ones. Um, however, the nature of the therapy was much more difficult to determine and we didn't really attempt to. Um, as I mentioned, like most of our patients were from rural Tennessee and the quality of um, treatment that they got was probably extremely variable. I think a lot of the time they would have, they, it wouldn't have been like from um, an SLP with any expertise in aphasia. Um, so it might not have been appropriate for what they needed. And Really, there were not a lot of participants that had, I don't think any of our participants had been in an ICAP. Um, and so my, and so like I mentioned at the start of my question, like, you know, I did find your paper quite convincing. Um, so I do think that if we had a group of patients who had been in ICAP, we might've seen something different. I actually have a collaboration with Maya Henry um, right now um, where we are looking at, um, the well, we're looking at uh, ICAP patients going through their ICAP in in Austin, Texas. Um, we're doing kind of pre-post functional MRI on them, um, so I'm hoping to you know 
learn more about that as we go on. Thanks for the question. Great, thank you. And and kind of related, um, and you almost answered some of this already, um, from Kathleen, did these participants get any aphasia therapy in this year post-stroke? And if so, is there any evidence that it had an impact on the recovery trajectories, I guess? Yeah, I mean, yeah, so they did. Uh, about two thirds of them had some therapy. Um, and no, there wasn't any evidence that it made a difference. <laughs> Um, but I, you know, again, I'm, I would like to emphasize that in this case, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. Um, you know, we really, the study wasn't designed to assess the efficacy of therapy. Um, and the therapy they got was extremely variable in quality, and we didn't have, you know, a great measurement of it. So, yeah, I don't want to make strong claims. Um, but it certainly wasn't, you know, it's just, it's obvious. And I don't think that this would surprise any working aphasia uh, treatment specialist, you you know, having a couple of hours of you know, kind of re relatively arbitrary speech therapy that's not targeted to the individual's deficits uh, it doesn't make a measurable impact. Yeah, and and I think there's a lot of work going on again in CRE where we're looking at this idea of dose and and how we measure that. So yeah, very relevant to our work too. Um, yeah. A couple of questions from Miranda. So Miranda Rose, um, first one, do, you, do your 13 recovery subtypes offer a better way to categorize aphasia early after stroke as compared to the eight WAB aphasia subtypes? Uh, Miranda, thank you. Um, also love your recovery work, of uh, your treatment work too, of course. Um, and I love this question because my answer is unequivocally yes. I, I do believe that like this is a a much more productive way to think about subtyping patients after stroke, um, because um, you know, especially acutely, um, you know, the acute presentation can be so impacted um, by medical factors um, that ultimately are not that important for the final outcome. Like I, the final outcome really is determined by the anatomy of the damage. Um, the WAB subtypes have, you know, you know, there's there's good things you can say about the WAB, but um, one negative uh, is that you know, as as you know, there there can be very sharp borders between subtypes, right? So you get one, you make you get one question right or wrong, and that's going to change you from one aphasia subtype to another. Um, so I don't think that that's a good way of categorizing people acutely or chronically, and I definitely don't think it's a good. I don't. I mean, you know, there's a lot of it's very like aphasia subtype as measured by the web is extremely dynamic, right? And that's been shown in several well-known studies. Um, like by Audrey Holland, for instance, Pashek and Holland. Um, you know, it just it, it's just not a very meaningful way of classifying people um, when the real determinant is is the brain. Um, so yeah, I do think this is a better way to think about it. I'm not sure that our 13 subtypes are perfect, or or even maybe that close, or even you know that great. Um, hopefully, we'll. Be more even to be able to do it more accurately as we get more data going forward. Um, but I do think the idea of like if we want to subtype people, which is useful for practice, then it should be done based on lesion anatomy, like not on initial behavioral presentation. Definitely. Right. Thank you. Um, and another one from Miranda. If aphasia therapy does indeed have an impact on recovery, we might want to also include that in models. I guess it's possible that your current data may contain patients who receive therapy doses that are ineffective, something that you touched on already. Mm -hmm. We know that current clinical practice is not aligned with recommendations for overall dose of intensity. Uh, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, we definitely include therapy in our model, but we, I, we don't really need to yet because the amount of people, the amount of therapy that people are getting in rural Tennessee is so minimal um, that there's probably only a handful of patients in our whole sample that received an adequate dose. So, you know, most people are getting, you know, like an hour a week or something. I mean, it's not, it doesn't surprise me that it's not effective. Um, and, and I, you know, I really think like ICAPS and it is the, the way forward. Like I, I don't have any hope in like this, you know, idea that you can show up and have like a session, one or two sessions a week and expect to um, get much out of it. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I would, 
I wish that there was more variability in the amount of therapy and the amount and quality of therapy that people had gotten because it would have been really neat if we had have seen that people that got a lot of therapy did better, but that variability just wasn't present in the real world data um, in that part of the world. Yeah. Brilliant, thank you. Um, we've got a few more comments, um, which are talking about how great your paper is and how you managed to break down quite a complex paper and topic into a very accessible um, talk. So uh, passing that down. Oh, and Miranda, I was about to ask my question, but I'll give you Miranda's first. <laughs> um, she's got another one. Is repetition parceled out as a domain in the QAB? Wondering about its centrality in terms of recovery along with auditory comprehension. Repetition is so vital for language learning and relearning. Yeah, that's an interest, That's a really interesting question. So repetition is one of the QAB subscores and I actually left it out of this paper um, because um, even though we had the data, um, because I just found it to be very non-specific. And if I had have included it, it would have patterned very much like word finding um, and grammatical construction in the sense that it tracks very closely with overall severity. Um, so I sort of didn't find it very informative because of that. Um, but I guess it's useful. I mean, if you want to measure aphasia severity quickly, <laughs> then repetition is like a, definitely a way you could do it because it, it correlates really highly with like aphasia severity. But yeah, because we were trying to sort of think about like domains and subprocesses, I didn't really find repetition to be, I don't think it's a domain, right? Because it it draws on almost every actual domain, which is why it's a, a, why it's got such importance. Um, but it's not, it is it in itself is not really a domain because it crosses the domains. That's why I left it out of the paper. Because I couldn't fit another figure in, like, I couldn't fit like another, um, you know, graph in there and mm -hmm. i re and so i wanted to put in paraphasia which is not you know funny but paraphasia like phonological encoding which was not was not originally intended as a qab subscore um but in order to fit that in i had to kick something out so i kicked out repetition sorry and <laughs> um, I, I just wanted to ask kind of bringing in that or bringing on that point um what what made you develop a qab for this study was there was there a particular rationale for it sure i mean we wanted I mean, I didn't think that there was anything existing that um, would be suitable for the research context, right? So we needed to be able to test people at the bedside um, in about 10 to 15 minutes so as not to interfere with their clinical care. Um, but we also wanted to get into the domains somewhat. Like we don't just want to have a screener where it tells us like, you know, aphasia severity. Why well, you wanted to have like a little bit more, um, you know, granularity than that. Um, and I looked at what else was out there and I didn't think there was anything um, that was suitable. Um, and another, another thing we did is we developed three alternate forms. So um, we were, if, so that if we tested people repeatedly, they wouldn't be seeing the same items again and again. I don't know if that makes a difference or not, but I kind of felt more reassured like having alternate forms. Um, I wanted to do, I wanted to make a better, distinction between sentence comprehension and word comprehension than most of the existing batteries do. Um, and the way that we test, and especially sentence comprehension, I'm very interested in, I love syntax. And um, I feel like sentence comprehension is not well tested in any major batteries, even the good batteries like the cat, um, because I, I think that sentence to picture matching is a very problematic way to do it because of the executive and working memory demands it has. And so we did a real world sort of truth verification task, which I think is, is, provides a, a lot better assessment of sentence comprehension. So it was sort of a combination of wanting something that was the right length um, and then also wanting to correct um, some limitations that we thought we could do a better job on. Okay, great. And, and is it available? Oh yeah, I mean, it's published, so yes. QAB is published in 2018 um, in plus one so that it's open access, Creative Commons license, do whatever you want with it. Um, um, and people and have I'll been translating it into uh, several different languages, which they which they are free to do. And we have Spanish um, and Arabic and French um, and se lots of uh, several other languages already and, and more in progress. So I will say this, the QAB was not intended to be a clinical battery. It's really quite, kind of complicated. Um, it's hard to score. You need quite a lot of expertise to score the connected speech samples. Um, so, you know, it was intended for research, um, but, you know, just so 
buyer beware. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, once again, I think we've run out of time now. So thank you very much, Stephen Wilson, for your time today. It's been a fascinating talk. Um, I think you've given us all a little bit of insight into that paper. Thanks very um, much for the opportunity. I um, really appreciate the chance to talk about our paper. And I hope if you want to learn more, it's on, on my website. And yeah, thank you. Absolutely encourage people to read the paper. It's great. Um, just before we finish, I do just want to tell you about the next seminar. Um, so next Next month, we'll be hearing from Dr. Sam Harvey, who will be presenting to us about examining the role of um, treatment dose in aphasia recovery. This seminar will take place on Wednesday, the 24th of May. So follow us on Twitter and via our community of practice for details of how to register. See you then. And thank you very much for joining us today.